So thank you. Thank you, Tao, for your introduction. Uh, so I'll be presenting this webinar on autonomous marine robotics for collaborative radioactivity mapping in the context of the Ramones EU project. So uh, <clears throat> this is not just my work, it's work of uh, all people here at ISTID uh, and also some of the partners within Ramones that worked on the work packages that we are leading. So I'll do just a brief presentation to the Ramones project. Uh, what are the objectives and uh, what are the challenge, what challenges this brings to marine robotics? Uh, so <clears throat> Ramones, uh, the name Ramones comes from the radioactivity monitoring in ocean ecosystems. And this is precisely what we want to do uh, within the project. So it's a pioneer project to map and have long-term measurements of uh, radioactivity uh, in the ocean. Um, so with a focus on long-term long uh, radioactivity mapping, and this is important not just because of uh, artificial radioactivity sources or some sources of pollutants or in the wake of accidents like recently in Fukushima, but also to map natural radioactivity represented here uh, in this picture um, by that hydrothermal vent. So <clears throat> what is Ramones? In Ramones, we will have uh, the idea is to have several assets with capabilities to measure radioactivity and have them installed in the ocean uh, where they can take measurements while they uh, move and uh, cover the maximum area uh, or volume possible. The idea for this project uh, is to start small. So we will have uh, three mobile assets, these two gliders, a surface vehicle, and a benthic station. Uh, the mobile vehicles will be equipped just with gamma sniffers. This is a radioactivity sensor that allows to measure um, uh, gamma ray uh, energy. Uh, released by um, radioactive decay uh, of several elements. This is completely natural. Just because it's radioactivity it doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, harmful to us. And this is even just being in the, in the air outside, we are bombarded with uh, background uh, level of radiation, which for us is uh, perfectly tolerable. <clears throat> so free mobile assets and one uh, fixed asset uh, here, this Pentex station, will, which will have more capability in terms of power and will have much more sensors, namely also measure, measuring alpha and beta radiation. So how does this integrate with ocean robotics? Well, how do the robots come in into the project? So we have these uh, several assets and now they have to communicate with each other and coordinate, adapt, uh, plan the missions, and execute the missions all in a coordinated way. This is brought possible by a communications network between them, uh, which underwater uh, is mostly based on acoustics. So the, the vehicles will, uh, will be equipped with acoustic modems, which allow them to communicate and also acoustic sensors, which will allow them to locate underwater, as I will explain um, further along the, the webinar. So the focus here is on cooperation, have these vehicles cooperate towards a common goal. And this is mostly through um, <clears throat> motion planning. So they have to coordinate where they want to go in order to map the most possible terrain cooperative navigation. So they will communicate between themselves and execute maneuvers or communicate data in a way that will allow them to better estimate their position. And then uh, cooperative control will they execute those paths also cooperatively. So keeping uh, some distance or being within a vicinity that will allow them to, to communicate. So all of the vehicles will run this independent loop, but share information through this communications network. Uh, <clears throat> the key technological challenges coming from this uh, are 
for cooperative uh, navigation of the multiple vehicles, the limited energy and communication available on board. So underwater, we don't have uh, high bandwidth uh, wireless communication like we have uh, at the surface. Uh, and uh, so it's mostly based on acoustics and that's a very demanding, very high energy communication. So we want to reduce communication as much as possible but still be able to help uh, the to have the vehicles help each other. And this also causes problem for uh, navigation, which is how the vehicles understand where they are, because we cannot put uh, all the sensors we would like, um, such as uh, IMUs or high precision, um, big volume uh, inertial units that allow the vehicle to understand better where it is we have to we are constrained by the capabilities or and the long endurance of the mobile platforms so for position communication uh, the problems are similar we have a low bandwidth so we have to communicate sparsely and uh, the depth profile of the sound in water affects these acoustic communications and it reduces noise and zones where we don't have visibility uh, or communication with the vehicles. <clears throat> For adaptive motion planning and cooperative control, uh, we are again limited by the, the resources that we have and this unconventional measurement, which is radioactivity, uh, which behaves stochastically. Uh, we have an average number of uh, the case per second, but it's um, it's stochastic. It depends. It's not a constant measurement such as temperature or conductivity. So this introduces additional problems on trying to use this to guide the vehicles and have them understand where is the source of uh, radioactivity. Finally, uh, we have how to integrate all these systems. Uh, what software systems do we need? How can we test things before going into the water? Um, <clears throat> how can we debug uh, all our algorithms before going into the ocean with the real vehicles for the real missions? Uh, and finally, so for, the, for that, we will have uh, hardware in the loop simulations, uh, which will help us debug the algorithms, the vehicles, the hardware inside, so running everything as if it was the real system and then we'll have an easy transition from this hardware in loop simulations to the real vehicles so we'll just do a brief description of the assets we have we have this two slocum gliders which like i said are high endurance they are very reliable they've been in use for 30 years and been constantly updated they have the drawback of having uh, low power electronics and a long cycle time so every time we want we want to get data from it. It takes a few seconds to give us this, the data. It's not instantly uh, like a, a normal surface robot. Also, uh, one of the drawbacks of these vehicles is that they are typical, very autonomous. You program the mission before. Uh, and in Ramones, we want to adapt to measurements. So for that, we have this extra functionality of backseat driver which will allow us to have a, a computer on board, uh, getting data from the vehicle and uh, sending new commands, new directions to the vehicle. This will be equipped with USB-L modems and with a, a modem only um, acoustic, sound, uh, acoustic com communication um, uh, apparatus which will allow it to communicate with the surface vehicle and uh, also the Bentic station. Uh, the, the surface craft um, will be the main communications hub of the network. This will be able to communicate all the time with a ground station uh, using satellite communications. It also has long endurance, but unlike the gliders, it has a large payload and has multiple redundant communication ch channels. Like I said, we can have 4G, we can have the satellite uh, communication or even long range uh, radio. And finally, the Bentic station uh, will carry the, the bulk of the sensors because we can um, have uh, high energy, we're occupying a bigger volume here because it's fixed 
And um, the most interesting thing for us in the, this vehicle network is that it will have an acoustic modem and can help the, the gliders uh, localize themselves. These are the sensors that will be uh, added to the gliders and the surface vehicles. So the, they're relatively small. They can measure radioactivity and we can get spectrograms uh, like this one in the image. However, this spectrogram is not useful for finding the, the sources. We'd rather have just the number, each, each of these lines is a number of particle counts, and we would just rather have the whole detection in the whole uh, radioactivity uh, interval and use that number of counts to guide the, the vehicles as we'll see in the sequel. So, <clears throat> What tasks based on this challenge we will be uh, solving in, in remote? Uh, we need to solve the cooperative navigation problem, which is to know where the vehicles are, where they want to go, um, where are they going and how fast they're going. And for that, we'll use the onboard sensors, uh, which give provide position, attitude and velocity from the vehicles. And we'll need to fuse them with um, filtering algorithms to fuse all the data sources and improve the estimate uh, of the localization of the vehicle. And we'll have to do this within a, a cooperative framework, so where each node helps the, the other. The basic for, for this is uh, that reckoning where we only use the onboard sensors, but this is an open loop integration of the dynamics of the vehicles and as such has drift uh, a long time. How can we um, bound or minimize this drift? We can have extra sensors, which gives us, which give us uh, absolute positions or some inertial kind of position. This is the case for GPS for the surface vehicle or these USBL positioning systems for the gliders, which allow us to have relative position measurements with respect to the surface vehicle. The, the acoustic channel underwater, as I mentioned in the beginning, is noisy and can have several problems, namely that we might not always have uh, these positioning uh, measurements available. Sometimes we can get just degraded communication or the degraded measurements like only the ranges or only the bearings of their relative, uh, relative positions. So we need to have a system that degrades uh, gracefully between having a measurement of the position and have this, having this reduced measurement and still be able to improve and bound this, uh, that reckoning error. So the ASC, um, the, the positioning is not a problem. It knows its positioning from GPS with very high accuracy. For the underwater gliders, the main, uh, the main source of data will be the USPL positioning fixes, uh, so with acoustic messages. Um, <clears throat> and this can also be helped with uh, USPL or range measurements from the Bentic station once we know uh, where it's located, where it has been deployed in the world because it is not changing position, so it can be used as a an additional data point. So <clears throat> for this, uh, if we have, if we have the USBL measurements, this is very convenient for the gliders. We can just use a linear estimation method. So a linear Kalman filter and improve the measurements of the vehicles. If we have only ranges and if our performance is degraded and we have just range, measurements to the ASV, uh, it's more, it becomes a more challenging problem. It requires nonlinear uh, estimation framework like exogenous column filters. And the trajectories need to be rich uh, or richer in order to have, to be observable for the, we can, so that we can recover the whole position of the gliders. And similar effects uh, happen with the, the bearing once it gets the, the grade. We need to improve the estimation and take it to a, a nonlinear framework. So for, 
our, our models uh, for the position, we consider constant, we can have constant velocity models for the, uh, for the underwater gliders. Uh, and we can also estimate the, the current uh, based on the position measurements that we keep getting from the surface vehicle. We can do this all, all with this uh, linear common filter but always being careful to detect and reject outliers as they have a great influence on the, um, on the filter output and can lead to erroneous uh, results. <clears throat> For the ranges, uh, the models are similar, but like I said, we need to go to this um, extended common filter and nonlinear framework. And uh, the, same with the, the same with the bearings. This is an example um, of an application of this to a typical trajectory of the glider and thus trying to improve its estimation uh, of its navigation, so its position and velocity. Uh, the gliders navigate typically in this yo-yo movement um, underwater. So they have a, a buoyancy pump, which makes them heavier than uh, salt water to go down lighter than salt water to go up. And with the, the wings on the glider, it propels the glider uh, forward using this yo-yo movement, which is what their typical maneuver. Uh, in, uh, in this experiment, we have several outliers like you can see here, and we will have X, Y, and Z positions. So USBL uh, measurements for two sections of the maneuver in the beginning and in the end, and we'll use only uh, ranges in the middle. So with the graded performance. As you can see here, uh, the position error is well contained in the beginning and the end, uh, but then in the middle, if we don't use any measurements, uh, just with that reckoning, the X and Y will start to diverge. For, uh, for the vertical position, we can use a depth sensor. Uh, it's included in the, in the gliders and provides us a relatively noise-free measurement of the depth for free. So the, that error is always uh, small, but the X and Y uh, can grow unbounded if we don't get better measurements or if we don't use better techniques. If we have uh, range um, measurements here, um, this is the case with the position measurements. So this is the case with the range measurements. When we have ranges, we can bound this, uh, these errors and have good results. But we can see here problems due to outliers. In this case, we're not yet uh, rejecting the outliers. So we can see we can get very big errors uh, if we get erroneous ranges and they persist for a while. Correcting also for these outliers. Uh, we can see that we get much better um, errors for the X um, position. So this is the long track uh, while the glider is along, the, the glider is doing that yo-yo. Still just a minimal error persists on the Y uh, direction. And this is because this, the maneuver is just a straight line on 3D or a straight line going up and down and there's not enough, uh, rich enough to reduce this error. If we would, uh, we can get this error closer to zero using just, using just ranges. If we have the surface vehicle doing um, more interesting maneuvers. <clears throat> so now for motion planning, um, we want to avoid uh, doing exhaustive searches because the ocean is a vast environment. So we want to, to have the gliders go directly to where we think there are radioactivity sources. And while they measure radioactivity, being able to react to that radioactivity and change their course to map a more interesting area of the map. How do we do this? We do this in two steps. So on the first step, we plan their cooperative maneuvers uh, offline using a priori information about possible sources or locations of plumes from those isothermal vents. And then in a second step, while they are, um, while we are doing the mapping, uh, <clears throat> we will 
be updating this um, this probability map for the location of the sources and the plumes and um, redirect the vehicles uh, accordingly. So for that, we have developed this uh, BBOT uh, algorithm for optimal trajectories. This is uh, joint work with these other universities. Uh, it's capable of generating uh, feasible and collision-free trajectories for several vehicles and <clears throat> can have just uh, single or multiple vehicles. It works by converting an optimal control problem. So how do we get from where we are to where we want to go using the minimal control actuation and minimal uh, using minimal energy while still avoiding obstacles uh, and uh, other possible constraints and we can use it to to do real time uh, safety critical applications in uh, complex environments like the the ones we have underwater or others so we can accommodate 20 number of, of vehicles this is the this the first uh, step for the the initial maneuvers and then <clears throat> we have this probabilistic framework which captures the um, probability or the our knowledge of the location of the plumes so we'll start visiting uh, these plumes and while we're visiting the plumes we adapt get some new measurements so the plume uh, might not be so active we might have other plumes that are active and have not been mapped yet and the idea is to have the vehicle react to these uh, changes in the environment automatically inform the other vehicles and like this co collaborate to be, uh, to construct a common map um, and map the the widest uh, area of terrain uh, <clears throat> as i mentioned before this has never been done um, underwater um, and in this extent that we want to do in ramon's so it's a, a very challenging uh, problem. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, finally, I'd like to show an example of what happens uh, when the vehicles do not uh, do not have the complete USBL uh, measurements, and they still uh, need to do some cooperative uh, control uh, and localization. Uh, this is work with, that we developed to be applied in Ramones, but before we had the uh, glider vehicles, so we tested them um, with the existing vehicles at IST to check the feasibility uh, for further application uh, of similar techniques to Ramones. Here we have the control loop for each vehicle, which is working independently and they exchange uh, information regarding their um, control positions and also uh, the estimates uh, that they have for the target. So the idea is to have two surface vehicles. We have one unknown target uh, down, um, uh, down in the water and the surface vehicles want to locate that target using nothing but uh, range measurements uh, and keep synchronization among all vehicles. So this is the setup, two target, two trackers. They can communicate using radio because they're at the surface. And with the underwater vehicle, they use US, we use this USBL to get the, the position, but then just feed the, the ranges to the algorithm. So the algorithm works with the the graded mode, which uh, only requires the, the ranges. And this is, uh, I'll try to play a video. Okay, sorry about the sound. Um, so here in the center, we have the underwater vehicle connected to this antenna, just so we can maintain communications. The two trackers don't know what the underwater vehicle is doing. And now they are doing this optimal maneuver to, to reduce the uncertainty in the localization of the underwater vehicle. So it's keeping a formation of 90 degrees and doing a circular pattern around the, the vehicle. <clears throat> and this is, uh, here we, uh, we had a formation change just to show that 
the algorithm also works if we have the the tracker simply emulating the trajectory of the of the um, of the target um, in a parallel path, uh, doing a path parallel to it, like like here in this setup. Okay, and this is our test area in Expo. You will see more about it later. But sorry. Mm. Okay. Okay, so this is what we are doing, um, what's happening uh, inside the algorithm uh, for this video that I just showed. So the trackers need to um, create and follow this spatial and temporal curve uh, around the vehicle being tracked so that they need to cooperate between themselves to maintain that 90 degree uh, angle and um, keep getting updated estimates on the target uh, so that they keep tracking it. Uh, we have um, robust trajectory tracking laws with proven convergence for the target estimate and there's some mild assumptions and a distributed extended common filter. So because we were using ranges, this has to be in the nonlinear domain and a distributed control law that um, achieves this um, cooperation, this uh, pursuit and tracking uh, that you just saw. Uh, this distribute, the, the distributed part, uh, we minimize the number of communications uh, between the vehicles using event triggered, um, event triggered framework. So we are not always communicating with the vehicles at all time because that generates a lot of noise underwater and can make communication impossible um, for, for larger fleets. But the vehicles only communicate when they have something relevant to add uh, to the network. And if they see discrepancies between what they think is their estimation and what the, the network thinks uh, is the estimation of uh, their position. So <clears throat> the the <clears throat> the cooperative uh, control uh, and navigation methods that I showed you before are enabled by this positioning and uh, communications network uh, or sensors um, that are incorporated in the in the vehicles. So we will have uh, USBL heads that will allow us to to get uh, relative positions. Uh, from the vehicles to the surface vehicle on the gliders, and also normal uh, transponders, um, norm, just modems for communication in uh, ASC and the Bentic lab. This uh, provides us flexibility for the different scenarios we saw before. So if we have uh, positioning measurements, we can use the positioning algorithms. If we have the greater performance and can just get ranges or bearings, um, we can we can adapt uh, to it and use the um, the algorithms I just described. The uh, modems uh, and acoustic sensors from Evologix can work uh, unlike traditional ones, where to get the ranges you need to emit the signal and wait for the reply. Uh, this um, this uh, this equipment. Uh, can uh, estimate the range, uh, can measure the range between uh, the, the different elements only with signals in one direction. How can it do that? It, we need uh, very accurate clocks. And so the USBL, um, the, <clears throat> sorry. And so the, the modems are equipped with very precise uh, chip scale atomic clocks, which allow them to maintain, um, to maintain a synchronized time among all the assets during the duration um, of the Envision missions. This can be up to weeks. So we just need to synchronize uh, the clocks in the beginning of the mission and then um, the vehicles can just receive the signal from the surface craft. So just one signal, all the vehicles, all the underwater vehicles listen to it, and then they can uh, 
compute the, they can measure the range accurately because a priori they established exactly when they uh, when the signal would be sent. So with their atomic clocks, they can get a very fine measurement of the um, time it took the sound wave to get to the vehicles. And like that, we can get the, the ranges. For the position and bearing, um, the, this inverted USPL setup is used. I put here, um, so the top one is the Evologix um, equipment that we will use for the gliders. And inside this is something like this lower picture where we have an array of hydrophones. It is this array of hydrophones and the different arrival times uh, at each hydrophone that can allow us to understand where the, 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 the acoustic wave came from. And so have the bearing, which connected with the range measurement can give us the precise position, um, relative position of the underwater vehicles with respect to the surface vehicle. These systems can communicate up to three kilometers, so we can have a very uh, extensible surf, uh, monitoring surface uh, for the for amounts. And like I said, we can get uh, positioning to the to the surface vehicle or also to the Bentic station. So we need we will need two modems per glider, one pointing up and another pointing down to the Bentic station. The positions of the gliders, uh, the positions they measure are relatives, but they will be able to be converted to absolute positions using the um, GPS position for the sailboat, which is very accurate, and also the position of the Bentic station, which after an initial uh, measurement and improved uh, measurement of the location will be fixed uh, throughout the mission. The underwater assets will be equipped with this chip scale atomic clocks, and this is what will allow us to have this uh, silent um, mode and extend this to a bigger fleet in a future version uh, of the project, or at least it will allow us to scale the, um, the proposed method for Ramones to a fleet of N vehicles. <coughs> uh, <coughs> So working with these modems is cumbersome because we need to put them in the water, have them uh, in the water to test uh, communications and these algorithms. And so to have a faster pace of development and algorithm iteration, we is, use this emulator for the, um, for the modems, which allows us to emulate all the functions of the modem so they can uh, return us position, we can return us just the range or bearings. They simulate the physical layers, so the delays uh, due to the um, sound velocity in water and other uh, nonlinear um, physics of the propagation of sound through water. This enables us, enables us to do simulations easily in the lab and uh, can be integrated easily also with the vehicle simulator. So we can run uh, all the Ramones uh, integrated system in the lab, test everything in the lab before going to, to the ocean for a, a real mission. Uh, <clears throat> How do we integrate the, the software with the with the vehicles uh, and the other simulators that we have. We standardized all the computing uh, assets in Ubuntu and Rosnoetic. We have uh, simulations for all the vehicles in Gazebo using UV simulator, which allows us to have uh, uh, marine physics for underwater and uh, surface vehicles. Uh, we have developed uh, dynamic models for all the vehicles um, in this, within the simulator, and we can design uh, and adapt more, more models uh, if we have for the vehicles. Using ROS allows us to, to, to touch and to use a vast ecosystem of robotics tools and, and frameworks, and also collaborate with the, the wider robotics community 
uh, because uh, it is starting to standardize in ROS. And so using ROS, we can easily share our results and have other people use uh, the tools that, that are developed within Ramones and like that share the, uh, widen the, the, the reach uh, of the tools that we develop. Uh, the software that I uh, showed before for um, cooperative uh, motion planning, cooperative control, and cooperative uh, navigation um, is all developed. Uh, it was all developed by uh, IST. Uh, within Ramones, we have done a lot of improvements to it, uh, namely integrating better with this uh, gazebo simulator. And so now we have. Uh, the full stack of tools that we need for the vehicles. So inner loop controls for all the vehicles, this uh, cooperative framework, the sensor fusion, uh, and all the, the algorithms and communications that are necessary. We have um, open source at all, and it's available in, uh, IS, in this, the SAR ISR webpage. So if anyone is interested, and it's, um, easy to, to start and has a few examples and demos ready. Uh, so if anybody <laughs> wants to, to, try, to try out the, the tools and methods I'm seeing here, you can go to this web page and test them, uh, test them later and see if this is interesting for your work. So, <clears throat> So this contains everything uh, from the single vehicles controllers to also the wider cooperative architecture. This is an example of the, the control for a single vehicle, what is required for a single vehicle. So we have uh, the desired path that the vehicle wants to take. We have uh, an array of path following out algorithms, each with its advantage and disadvantages then, uh, that the user can choose. And then this path following gives, uh, is vehicle independent and gives references to these inner loops. And this is this, uh, the part that is vehicle dependent and needs to be changed for each vehicle. So this will be different for the gliders or for the surface vehicle or for the Medusa vehicles that you saw before um, in those uh, experimental results. This is just to try um, and transmit the, the complexity uh, involved in doing all this uh, cooperative um, control and navigation using several vehicles. Uh, we have this interface with the transducers. So this is the part with the modems and USBLs. The acoustic messages need to be decoded so that we can get the position of the vehicle. The position needs to be fed to the filter um, to improve the estimation of the vehicle. And parallelly, this, uh, the vehicle can also, besides the, the, the position measurements, we can also send and to receive um, arbitrary messages, which are used to pass along either commands from the top, uh, from a commanding station to the vehicles, or results regarding the, the mapping. So we can transmit back to shore the results of the mapping uh, that the vehicles are doing during remote, but they have to be very summarized, very short. Uh, we cannot send the raw data because of the restrictions of the acoustic channel underwater. Uh, and so all of this has been uh, connected together in ROS uh, the, within the scope of Ramones until that we have this final communication layer with the backseat driver uh, for the glider. So this is just a small example of the communication um, and estimation using acoustics for the glider uh, up to um, here the, the control and, and guidance uh, laws for the, for the gliders. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, we standardize on Raspberry Pi computers. They are low power um, within the limits of what we want for a mission. So I think we can get um, mission times of up to a week with these computers. They are powerful enough to run all our 
algorithms. The IST software already included a lot of uh, ROS applications for the, um, for the Medusa vehicles uh, and Blue Rock vehicles that we use uh, in our day to day. But additional interfaces had to be uh, done within Ramones for the surface vehicle and to the glider, so these new vehicles. In addition to that, the glider uh, had to be, uh, an interface had to be designed for ROS that can communicate with the backseat driver and provide commands to the, um, to the glider and receive uh, also the information regarding the glider state. <clears throat> Uh, and all this together with integration of the uh, acoustic modem emulator with Avalogix within this system allows us to have an end-to-end -end realistic, so physically model modeling um, uh, a lot of the physics of the environment uh, and allows us to simulate all this, like a real Ramones mission in the lab. Uh, <clears throat> Our simulations uh, also run uh, run not just on software, but also uh, are running also on the hardware of the vehicles. And it is this hardware in the loop that allows us to test even the electronics that go on the vehicles uh, and test them in a bench together with the, um, the, all the software architecture so that we can um, clean the bugs, uh, have the the mission software ready uh, and also the vehicle software ready so that when we go to the water we can be very confident that um, things will work and we work at the at the first try uh, all the algorithms that we are doing for the vehicles or, or the vast majority are based in ROS in C++ uh, which is also very efficient and uh, catered to the, the, the power requirements uh, of the vehicles. So here on the left, uh, we have the, an image from the simulator where we have a Medusa vehicle, and this is the expo test site that you saw before for the slap um, experiment. And this is the actual environment. So you can even see we modeled uh, the environment in a similar way. Uh, and this has been very fruitful for, for us as it allows us to save a lot of time and do most of the debugging in the lab instead of in the field where everything is uh, much more difficult. So where do, where do we go from here? Uh, we have this integrated system everything is working in simulation, what is missing? So uh, the gliders uh, we were delivered end of last year. We're still assembling them and uh, incorporating all the sensors and, um, and acoustic equipment. Uh, and we're missing, uh, we're still uh, awaiting this extra glider section that is needed to fit all these sensors and hardware that we want on the vehicles. So <clears throat> uh, we need to integrate the gamma sniffers, uh, physically integrate as the, the software integration is already being worked on uh, and being just fine tuned. We need to physically integrate the acoustics and then we need to do more tests to develop and refine the software and um, have the, the vehicle ready to, to perform uh, field tests in control condition. So in that expo environment, that's what we ideally would like to have, to have the surface vehicle, either the real one or a surrogate from the, one of the existing vehicles from ISR. Uh, and the gliders. What's the main problem um, with using that expo space? The gliders, uh, as you saw before, need some depth to do that typical yo-yo uh, maneuver. And uh, the volume that we have available in, in expo only has four or five meters depth, which is insufficient um, to, to navigate, to, to control the gliders 
uh, and test the, the backseat driver and all our distributed uh, control and navigation. So what did we do to mitigate that? Uh, we created uh, additional hardware for the gliders, which is this floating foam, uh, which will enable the glider to just float. Instead of doing the yo-yo movement, we'll be able to float. And it was designed such that the rudder can be on the water at all time. Uh, and so we can have actuation from the rudder and from that thruster uh, that you see here. Um, and so we can control the vehicle on the water without ne needing the yo-yo movement. And with this setup, we can test all our algorithms here. Uh, because this is uh, such a confined uh, space, we also extended the rudder so that we have more actuation and we can do tighter turns uh, with the glider vehicle. So this was already tested. Uh, it, worked, uh, it worked well. We were able to do, this is still open loop maneuvers, just turning left and right to assess the, the glider maneuverability, but it proved a safe method um, and it will be used future, futurely for the control and guidance tests where we'll um, do the first test with the backseat driver. We also did the first in situ tests um, recently for the gamma sniffers. Uh, this is uh, measurements typical that we will have. So this is the spectrogram, but uh, we can only obtain such a clean spectrogram if we acquire a spectrum for a long time. The measurements uh, that are envisioned for amounts are typically shorter. And during that short, let's say 10 seconds, we'll have just a few radioactivity events. But from preliminary results, they seem to be, uh, uh, there seems to be um, enough variance in, in detector radioactivity to at least be able to distinguish between no radioactivity or just background radioactivity, uh, high radioactivity sources. So here we can get up to 12 events uh, per second. And we can also distinguish um, event, intermediate events. So this gives us some hope that we can use the, the gamma ray um, radioactivity measurements uh, from the gamma sniffers. The, these are the ones that will be used in the glider and gives us some hope that we can use and process this data and be able to, to use it to, to guide the gliders to, to, to the main source of radioactivity in the environment. Okay. And, um, and that will propel us to try to fulfill the Ramona's vision of multiple vehicles, multiple assets, long-term permanence at sea, collaborating to do uh, radioactivity uh, monitoring at scale. Okay, um, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm now available to take some questions for, for the, from the audience. Thank you very much, David. Um, the floor is open for questions. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> yeah, David? Yes, yes. Uh, Maybe you could um, sort of in your mind, <clears throat> what are the next steps, especially in what concerns the cooperation with the, our colleagues from, from Canary Islands? Uh, uh, yes, so uh, I haven't mentioned it now, but um, during the presentation, but the surface vehicle will be provided um, by the University of Canary, by a group, a research group in the Canary Islands, which have developed that sailboat, which, um, which can have this long time uh, endurance and stay at sea. So they have already uh, provided us with a ROS interface uh, 
um, to their vehicle, so we can uh, already we have uh, we can already send ROS commands uh, that we want the ASV to to track, and we are developing that part with their uh, hardware in the loop uh, simulator and connecting using the internet from Lisbon to Canary Islands to advance that um, part of the collaboration. So with that, we will have at least a simulation working and we can test the, the algorithms that we want the ASV to track. We, we, can, be, we can do that um, already in simulation. Next steps would be to have, uh, so once we have our gliders in the water, we would like to do tests with their uh, surface vehicle. Yeah, it is, in, it is envisioned for they for the for them to come to Lisbon around the end of this year, which is after we have the gliders uh, with the backseat driver working, so that we can test everything either here in Expo, or because it's a sailboat and needs a, a larger area, we can also test. Uh, either in Teju or close to the shore uh, in some protected area around Lisbon. While, um, while they don't come and we can test with the real vehicle, we'll be using uh, one of our surface vehicles from ISR, the Delphi, which is a catamaran uh, for the tests with the gliders. Uh, sorry, either Delphi or one of the Medusa vehicles since Mainly, we want to communicate using the acoustics, and all, all the rest will be similar between the ASV from Canary Islands and the, the one from Technical. The main difference will be the additional restrictions imposed by the fact that the surface vehicle from Canarias is a um, sail, sail, sailing boat. So we are restricted on the kind of maneuvers that we can ask, but that's uh, something that we will have to check in simulation and try to accommodate what we want uh, for the overall uh, Ramones ensemble, uh, for the ASV, the maneuvers for the ASV to do, and take into account the restrictions from the fact that is a, a cell drop. So the, Next steps is a lot of work in simulation, trying to fine tune the, algorithm, the cooperation algorithms that we have to accommodate the, the constraints from being a cell drone, do the tests here in Lisbon using surrogate vehicles, and then hopefully soon um, have them come to Lisbon and test all the Ramones vehicles um, except the connection with the Bantic station or have another surrogate for the Bantic station. Thank you. Uh, yes, Tom? Yes, thank you. Uh, David, again, thank you. Very, very nice presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um, I have seen the full potential of the algorithms and the methodology behind being deployed. I have a question. I have a couple of questions, actually. One is uh, okay. regarding one of the final uh, diagrams you showed uh, regarding connectivity of gamma uh, sniffers together with the transducers and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, a few slides before the end. Um, yes, yes. I, you can I'll show that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's number 40, if mm -hmm. I can spot it well. Yes. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So this, uh, to me, it seems um, uh, simplistic. Uh, I put it in quotes in terms of the um, incorporation of the gamma sniffers uh, signals and logic inside the overall scheme, but um, I sense and I suspect that it's a lot more difficult um, from what you said. So the question is uh, the following. Um, what level of information you require extra additional to what you actually have now to really finalize this implementation. And I'm talking about also field tests, which you already mentioned, mm -hmm. but in terms of algorithms and methodology, I mean, programming behind. Okay, the, the programming and the software architecture is already finished or settled, uh, mostly settled. So using this, uh, we can communicate with the modem, so communicate with the surface vehicle. Uh, we can receive and send commands. 
uh, send sensor measurements, receive commands. And the, the gamma sniffers is here just shown with a ROS driver and then a data processing block. This data processing uh, hides a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of This stuff. is exactly the question about. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is uh, doing a lot of leverage here. So the data processing um, is, is now being undertaken by uh, a collaboration between N NTUA, I think it's, yeah, NTUA and IST. So uh, NTUA, uh, just coming back, we did tests uh, with the real sensors in Milos Island. NTUA gathered a lot of data using their own vehicle and having the, the gamma sniffer moving close to the sources, far away from the sources, over the vent field. So because this is a, a, a new sensor and because this is a new application, there is not much uh, in the literature about how to use this data to guide the gliders or what information we can get um, from it to easily use it to to provide new paths or new directions for the for the mobile assets so the the idea of this milus test was to gather the most data we could and now uh, we are working on do, doing all this data processing uh, check like i uh, showed before those counts per second at different distances from sources at different points in the world uh, and applying uh, either machine learning or more by hand algorithms that can take that data, take the position estimates for where the gamma sniffer was, for where the vehicle was, and using those two sources of data, uh, compute or tell us which direction uh, or what do we think is the general mapping of radioactivity around the region where the vehicles are and in which direction the radioactivity seems to be increasing, because the idea is to um, locate sources of high radioactivity. So the, it is all, all this data processing, this fusion of the information from the sensors and the positioning of the vehicles that is like hidden here on this data processing that is still needs to, there's still some work that needs to be done but it doesn't influence the overall architecture of the communications motion of the, the, the robots. This data processing is just to say, you should move in this direction, okay? Yeah. So, uh, or or you, this, should map, yeah. you should map this region of the world. The, that's what we get from this data processing. Okay, and sure. uh, you are right, this is, where there's ongoing work and this still not, not finalized. And, and the second question is actually also relevant to this one uh, and has also to do with um, the two spec that you showed at the end. When you mentioned something about the variance, sufficient or enough variance as you mentioned it, could you quantify that? Because I think I missed that part if you did. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can see also I'm really optimistic about this, uh, this one. Okay. I have to tell you, but... Uh, <laughs> Can you quantify it in terms of the algorithms and what you would like to expect from uh, with any criteria you apply for? Um, sure. So this, is so, so this is just uh, a plot I did with uh, radio raw radioactivity measurements from the gamma sniffer in several points in the world. We didn't have the acoustic system um, for this mission. So we don't know exactly where the vehicle was. We have a hard time mapping these measurements to the to the world, but we can easily see that there are some regions of background where the counts per second are always below two. And we can see that our regions of high activity where counts per second are uh, around 12. Moreover, instead of just on off, so high activity, low activity, we can also perceive these regions where the radioactivity is a bit, um, shows intermediate values, okay? And it's the, the seeing this full range from background to high intensity that could uh, give us intuition or idea of where to move 
next the vehicle. So if the vehicle is somewhere with nothing, it sees some points with radioactivity, okay, I should continue in my current direction or at least map uh, within a cone around that direction. If it sees, if it keeps seeing increasing measurements, it's going in the right direction. If measurements keep uh, start decreasing, maybe it's uh, deviating from the from the local maximum uh, of radioactivity and so should come back to the original place. So <clears throat> now there's a lot of work to be done between fusing these raw numbers, raw measurements from um, the radioactivity and joining them with this probabilistic framework that I showed you before of where do we think where's our best guess for high activity and try to pass so from these measurements to a, a probability map or for for activity uh, in the world and then have that map guide the the vehicle yes so that, that, yeah. that's one way uh, we can also just you know map and have some other algorithms uh, namely from NTUA uh, guide us, guide the vehicles to, to where they should go. So there's a combination of these two methods. Thank you. Yeah, that explains it. Thank you very much. Okay. Any more comments or observations, remarks, questions? I think it has been a very interesting seminar, at least uh, uh, from my taste, and I think everybody else is here. Um, I hope we should uh, actually repeat it at some point, because this is really interesting work uh, that has been carried out. Thank you very much, David, for that. Okay. Well, welcome. Pleasure to, to be here. And looking forward for the, for the next ones. Good. Yeah, David, thank you very much. Very well done. Thank you. Okay, and thank you also for the. Thank you, David. Thank to, you for the audience webinar. For, thank you for showing up. Yeah. So, if that's all, then perhaps we should call it an end here. Uh, just remind everybody that uh, this video will be available on our YouTube channel, Ramon's YouTube channel. Please uh, search for that. And of course, uh, all Ramon's members will be informed about it. Again, I would like to thank you all for being here and also. Um, again, my apologies for the little confusion at the beginning regarding the link. No David, it's been uh, an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing. You guys take good care. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank